Hello and welcome to our service today. A few days ago I took a trip up to the top of Humbleton Hill. Now, I don't know how well you know Wooler and the surrounding area but Humbleton is a hill that overlooks the town and is a bit of a local landmark. There's an Iron Age hill fort on the top and it even gets a mention in Shakespeare's play Henry IV Part I. And when you've got to the top of the hill, well, there's a fantastic view. And I love it up there. It really makes you feel alive. And not just because of the blood pumping through your veins after the steep climb. But when you've got your breath back, you can see for miles. You can see across the hills, around the Cheviots to Yavering Bell. You can look up to the wind farm at Barmore and on a clear day see along the Millfield Plain to Millfield Village in the distance. And then nestling at the foot of the hill is the town of Wooler, where I live and work. And when I'm up on top of the hill, I can see things that I don't normally notice when I'm busy around the town. You can see the river winding its way through, the course of the old railway, which of course is long since gone, the field patterns and how the landscape all fits together. It really takes me out of day-to-day -day chores and duties. It lifts me up and helps me to see things from a new perspective. The view from the hill really helps me to see things more clearly. Early in Jesus' ministry, in Matthew chapter 5, we discover that Jesus liked to go up a hill as well. In Matthew 5 we read this, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Well, of course, the hill that Jesus went up in first century Palestine would have looked very different from Humbleton Hill, but I'm guessing that it had the same effect and that Jesus used the view from the hill to teach his followers to see things more clearly. Matthew records some of the things that Jesus taught his disciples in what we now call the Sermon on the Mount. And that sermon began with a series of eight blessings or beatitudes. They were statements that would have really challenged those who heard them. 
they would have challenged them to see things from a new and different perspective. As Jesus taught them, the view from the hill was very different from what they expected. The view from that hill was radical. The view from the hill was something that they longed for more of. Well, over the next few weeks, we're going to share that view from the hill. But don't worry, you don't have to puff your way up, Humbleton, like me. We're going to be taking in the view by looking closely at the Beatitudes. And we're going to be learning a bit more about what it means to be blessed by God. And just like the view from the top of Humbleton Hill, it's a view that we never grow tired of. Through our series, we're asking God to open our eyes to his blessing, to know more of him, so that we might follow Jesus ever more closely. What a privilege that is. Welcome to Worship from Wooler. Enjoy the view from the hill.
praise you, O God, with words of thanksgiving in our mouths and in our hearts, words which can never really do justice to the depth of your care for us. We rejoice in your blessings, yet we so often fail to live up to them. Like your people of old, we often desire to fashion you in our image or in ways that we can control. Knowing these failings of ours as you do, you still invite us to share your life of grace and abundant love by being united with Jesus Christ through the power of your Spirit. We do not deserve such gifts. We can only receive them and respond because Jesus intercedes for us in our weakness. May this time of worship and our daily living proclaim our thanksgiving for these undeserved and lavish gifts of grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At the school Christmas fair, there was always a complete range of stalls and attractions to have a go at, to spend a bit of pocket money on. And there was one particular one that always used to puzzle me. It was called a boggle box. And it was a sort of tall rectangular column that stood on a desktop, shaped a bit like a periscope. And what you had to do was look in at the top of this box and then underneath, at the bottom, draw a particular shape. And the problem was that within this column, within this box, there was a complex system of mirrors, so that everything that you looked at appeared back to front and upside down underneath where you were trying to draw the shape. And it was almost impossible to get that shape correct because nothing looked quite how it should and I remember almost being dragged away by my parents because I kept spending money trying to have another go at this infernal contraption. The disciples of Jesus must have had something of the same feeling when they heard him start his teaching. The kingdom was going to be given, he said, not to the rich not to the mighty, not to the powerful, but to the poor, the humble, the meek. What on earth was going on? It must have seemed an upside down, back to front, topsy-turvy sort of message to them. Not the sort of thing that they expected to hear from someone who is initiating a new kingdom, a new era of God's rule. What an upside down message to receive. Let's have a look at this visualisation of how Matthew records the sermon in chapter 5 of his Gospel. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This upside-down message 
confounded the expectations of those who followed Jesus. They anticipated a kingdom that was essentially a new political or military rule. They thought it was going to be something that would bring them freedom from the Roman oppression that they had endured for so long. But instead, they heard that message, a message that said that true freedom comes not through military might, but with a restored relationship with God himself. And this is the good news of the kingdom, a divine invasion of grace and love, a new order where the world is changed, but it's changed by ordinary people joined with Christ rather than changed by an army carrying weapons of force. And it's this kingdom, this kingdom is what Jesus describes in the Beatitudes, one that is here and now, but most likely won't meet your expectations in the way that you thought it would. This passage has got to be one of the most familiar passages of Jesus' teaching, and yet it's one of the ones that is most often misunderstood. Each of the eight Beatitudes that Jesus gives in his Sermon on the Mount is framed in exactly the same way, and each one consists of three parts. Let's just have a look at that first Beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Each beatitude starts in the same way. It starts with a blessing. And isn't that good news to begin with? Because there it is, right at the start, right at the beginning, the statement, the fact that God wants to bless us, all of us. God wants to give us his blessing. That's fantastic news. Sometimes, you know, we have this picture of God as something like a mean old man, someone who's trying to trip us up or find fault, find an excuse to punish us. But there it is from Jesus' own lips that God wants to bless us. And if that isn't amazing, if that isn't good news, then I don't know what is. Various versions of the Bible translate the word blessed differently. Some say happy, others say fortunate. Tom Wright is my go-to theologian for all sorts of questions. And in his translation, he uses the words wonderful news for the poor in spirit. Each translation has its uses, but I'm not sure that any of them really reach the fullness and richness of the word blessing. This is God wanting to pour out his love and his affirmation on us. So that's the first part of each beatitude, a blessing. And having announced his blessing, Jesus then describes a characteristic or a calling, something that his listeners are asked to emulate or to nurture in themselves. And in this one, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. We'll come back to what that means in a moment or two, but let's be absolutely clear about one thing. These are not standards that Jesus is telling us that we need to attain. He's not saying, I'll only bless you if you manage this, miss it and you miss out. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, this is how I want you to live. And if you'll allow me, I will help you do that. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a preacher from Westminster Chapel, described it in this way. He said, we are not told in the Sermon on the Mount, live like this and you will become a Christian. Rather, we are told, 
because you are a Christian, then live like this. So they're not standards. They're things to look for, characteristics to nurture and encourage in each other. So we have a blessing, we have a calling, and then at the end of each beatitude, Jesus offers us a promise. And this promise is what someone who lives by the calling will receive. And the first and the last of the Beatitudes, the promise is the same. They're like bookends at each end of this passage. And it's nothing less than the kingdom of God itself. The promise is the kingdom of God. This then is the pattern that Jesus outlines for each of us. A blessing, a calling and a promise which leads to fullness of life that we can only find in Jesus. Over the next few weeks we're going to look at each of these Beatitudes in turn. But it's important, although we're going to look at them separately, it's important to understand that they fit together as a whole, that they're to be seen as one. And no one beatitude is any more important than the rest. And equally, we can't pick and choose which ones we like the look of, or which ones are easiest, or which ones are better suited to our characters. They all go together. They are all for all of us. They're complex, they're surprising, and they're certainly challenging. But they are also very beautiful. And they describe what it means to live as a child of God. So let's just return for a moment to the first beatitude that Jesus describes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And this is a great example of that counterintuitiveness of the beatitudes, the upside down way of thinking that Jesus introduces us to. Because surely that can't be right. Surely Jesus would want us to be rich in spiritual insight, not poor. Well, yes, of course, that's right, until we realise that we can only be filled with spiritual riches when we empty ourselves of every ounce of our own spiritual pride and self-reliance. Thomas Watson, a Puritan preacher in the 1600s, put it like this. Till we are poor in spirit, we are not capable of receiving grace. If the hand be full of pebbles, it cannot receive gold. The glass is first emptied before you pour in wine. God first empties a man of himself before he pours in the precious wine of his grace. Till we are poor in spirit, Christ is never precious. I love that picture that Thomas Watson paints of hands so full of ordinary pebbles that they can't receive the gold of God's grace. To be poor in spirit is about how we approach our relationship with God. It's an attitude of honest recognition that we are totally dependent on God, that we are created by God. We owe God everything. God is the one on whom the whole of creation, the whole of life depends. God is the source of that life. And God is the one whose endless outpouring of creativity sustains life. God wants to make us rich, 
by enabling us to live our lives well. And to live life well means living in a relationship with God and with one another. Let's pause for a moment and listen to Liz, who's going to read some verses from the last book in the Bible, from Revelation, that has more to say about how we live life well. A reading from Revelation, chapter 3, starting at verse 17. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realise that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so that you can see. Those whom I love are rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So God wants to bless us, but God will never force himself on us. There will only be room for God's rich blessing in our lives if we recognise our own poverty and let him in. We must choose to be poor in spirit and we never move on from that position for only then can we receive the kingdom of God. Being poor in spirit means that we live life in the knowledge that we need God's help to live our lives in his way. We cannot do it by ourselves. We do so as a blessing, a gift that is absolutely free, a gift that is utterly undeserved. Wonderful news for the poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Let me be as God. 
As we come together in prayer, let us bring to mind any we know who are in need, be it economically, emotionally, physically, mentally or spiritually. Lord, we pray for the poor of our community, our country and the world. Lord, you have asked us to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, but it's not always obvious who those people are. Help us to be aware of situations where we might be able to help, to be obedient to your calling and live as your ambassadors. Help our political leaders to understand the need for the right policies to tackle poverty. Save us from the wrong policy decisions that risks precious resources in wrong avenues. Renew our hearts to care for the poor. Help them to see the greater hope and joy that is in you and help them see the hope that is alive in you. Lord God, you are always near to us, especially when we are weak, suffering and vulnerable. Reach out to those who experience mental illness. Lift their burdens, calm their anxiety and quiet their fears. Surround them with your healing presence that they may know that they are not alone, especially in this time of isolation from the people they care about. And when they are unable to access the help they may need. Heavenly Father, we lift up all those who are ill. So many are fearful for the future and have had tests and medical procedures delayed. Others are afraid to go to their doctor about a problem, particularly in this time of pandemic when the NHS is under such pressure. Give them the hope and courage they need today and every day. Comfort their pain, calm their fears and surround them with your peace. Loving Lord, in this last year, through the worst of a global pandemic, we've been face to face with our fragility and vulnerability perhaps for some of us as never before. So much heartache and loss of people we have cared for. We give you thanks for the lives of these loved ones and we ask for your strength and peace to be with all who mourn. We give thanks for the life and service of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Some are called to the front of the stage, others to supporting roles, and we rejoice in the way he supported Her Majesty the Queen through all of the years of her reign. We remember too his work supporting charities, and perhaps most memorably for young people, for over 60 years, his patronage of the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme. In this hour of loss, we offer our heartfelt prayers for Her Majesty and her family. Comfort them in their loss, bind up their wounds and grant them the consolation of a store of treasured memories. Grant Her Majesty the peace that comes from knowing you and which passes all understanding. Dear Lord, 
We try so hard to be self-sufficient, to be rich in spirit, but ultimately our efforts to rely on ourselves fail. By your grace, we realise just how much we need you. So we come to you, not full of riches or full of ourselves, but empty, needy, truly poor in spirit. And you, Lord, meet us in our poverty. You not only meet our needs, but you pour out blessings upon us. You take our poverty of spirit and give back the riches of your spirit. You uphold us when we are weak. You comfort us when we are afraid. You make your kingdom available to us, graciously reigning over our lives. All praise be to you, dear Lord, because you invite all who are needy into your kingdom so that you might bless them with your inexhaustible riches. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in our worship today. No matter how widely scattered we are, it's so good to come together and worship God and hear his word and apply it to our lives. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be taking one of the Beatitudes each week and exploring it more. We're also going to be carrying those through our Monday night Bible studies and our morning prayers Monday to Friday, both of which happen on Zoom. And you can get the joining details from me by dropping an email uh, on to the address that's on the screen. I had somebody contact me just a week or so ago who said, I don't normally come to your church. Am I allowed to join in? And of course, the answer is yes. Absolutely everybody is welcome to join in any of our activities. And on our morning prayers, we have people from as far afield as Cornwall and across the border into Scotland come and join us for 15 minutes of prayer. On our Bible study, we even have an international flavour when Amy sometimes joins us from New York. So wherever you are, feel free. We'd love to have you along as we explore these Beatitudes and discover more about the life that Jesus would have us lead. A prayer as we come to the end of our time together. Lord Jesus, as we listen to your teaching, may we sit down with you on the mountainside. Show us your view from the hill and help us to see things more clearly than we have before. Give us your perspective, we pray. Help us to put, us, put aside our self-assurance that we're always in control and instead let us be open to your spirit so that we might see more of your kingdom in the people and the world around us. Amen. We look forward to seeing you next time, but until then, keep safe, keep taking in the view from the hill, and keep coming to Jesus with empty hands so that you can receive the gold of his grace. We look forward to seeing you again next week. In the meantime, God bless.